I'm going to begin with a perhaps surprising recommendation. If you do not know the Mahler 6th, I urge you to stop this video right now and go instead to part two, where I present the music and my analysis. Watch that first, then return to this. Here's my reason. You cannot know how an unfamiliar piece of music will turn out until you've heard it all the way through. That means you can't know what the artist was trying to say until he has had his say. One of the greatest joys you can have in hearing a piece of music for the first time, which of course you can only do once, is piecing together the clues as the composer drops them and trying to figure out where it's all going, how it's going to end. I don't want to be guilty of spoiling that for you. I want you to see the end of the movie for yourself. After you've heard the music, then come back and see what I've had to say about it. I'm posting this video exactly two years and four months later than I originally intended to post it. I abandoned my work on it exactly two years, four months, and two days ago. I just returned to it two weeks ago. This video has had a hard birth. In early March 2019, I began my treatment of Gustav Mahler's symphonies and had posted videos covering the first five of them by late April. That's when I started my work on this one, intending to post it on the 108th anniversary of the composer's death on May 18th. It was during my work on that final movement that one of Mahler's hammer blows fell on me. That's when I walked away from the project. It's only now, after two years of healing with Polly, Loki, and Phoebe, that I found the fortitude to return to that unfinished project and bring it to completion. You should understand it to be my memorial to end a scene whose passing left a void in my heart that is empty, that will never be filled, and that will always ache. This morning began with a field trip to an eroded patch of an ancient alluvial plain about an hour from where I live. A last chance to get out into the semi-natural world for a while before beginning the difficult work of finding the appropriate words to say about the Mahler Sixth. Here are some paleosol horizons visible at the site with the open ground and talus piles replete with small barite crystals and hematite nodules with a little alluvial petrified wood and malachite stained sandstone as a garnish. Here's some petrified wood I found at the site this morning and here's Loki and a pen for scale. The birth of Mahler's Sixth Symphony was strangely anomalous, and the work had an uneasy infancy. What makes the symphony's birth unusual is that it was composed by an artist who, at that time, had every reason to celebrate his life. The years 1903 through 04, when he composed the symphony, and on through 1906, when the final revision was published, were among the happiest he had ever known. He had achieved notable success in his career as conductor and as music director of the Vienna Court Opera, some recognition at least as a composer to be reckoned with, and was enjoying a life that was completed by the kind of loving family that he had not known as a child, an adoring and supportive spouse and two beautiful little daughters, a picture-perfect life. Yet it was in that context that this tragic symphony was brought forth, along with the even more heart-wrenching Kinder Totenlieder. Who writes music like that ever? To say nothing of when one has every reason to be happy. When you have two sweet little daughters playing around the house, how can you write songs on the death of children? This was a very troubled soul. Mahler didn't just compose willy-nilly. He was probably the most intentional composer who ever lived, every bit as intentional as Webern and far more driven. In every one of his symphonies, Mahler set himself a problem to solve, and each of his symphonies can be read that way. So here's a way to read the sixth 
Mahler took a traditional musical vehicle, the four movement symphony that follows a particular pattern and used that pattern's outlines as guardrails for the creation of his most avant-garde music to that point. What a remarkable tension that is. Let's consider it carefully. The standard model, the Haydn model, is of a four movement orchestral work following this pattern. First, a sonata form movement, introduction optional, with at least a repeated exposition. Followed then by a slow movement, often in sonata, ABA, or variation form. Then a two-part dance movement in da capo form, usually a minuet or a scherzo with contrasting trio. And then finally, another sonata form movement, usually more brilliant and entertaining than the first. That's the Haydn model, the model Beethoven inherited and proceeded, of course, to tinker with. Little by little, throughout his nine symphonies, the exceptions begin to creep in, and by the time you get to the ninth, much has changed. The inner movements have traded places, and the final movement includes the human voice, and apparently has nothing to do with sonata form. And for that matter, what is the form of the, the Grosse Fuga for string quartet, the original final movement of his B-flat major quartet, Opus 130? And in Beethoven's Ninth, the center of gravity has clearly shifted from the first movement, where it lay in Haydn's work and in much of earlier Beethoven, to the last. I believe it would be useful now to consider the parallels between the Beethoven Ninth and the Mahler Sixth, separated in time as they are by 80 years. Many of the things I said of the Ninth are also true of Mahler's Sixth, along with some things that I did not say. Both are minor key symphonies, but with a big difference to which I'll return. Both begin with large-scale sonata form movements in minor keys, but again there are differences about which more later. The second movement in both cases is a tonic minor key scherzo, and both include a major key trio in a contrasting meter, which is presented twice, resulting in the overall plan A, B, A, B, A. Again, there are plenteous differences, but the basic plan is similar in the Mahler Sixth. In both cases, the third movement is a slow one in a contrasting major key. Both of those slow movements treat two different themes, but in very different ways, about which more later. Both do, in a sense, afford a respite from the surrounding tempest. In the case of both symphonies, the final movement is the really vast one, larger by far than any of the others. Both of those final movements make reference to themes heard earlier in the symphony. They are both, in other words, cyclic. Now let's talk about the differences. Most importantly and most obviously, both of Beethoven's minor key symphonies, the C minor fifth and the D minor ninth, end in the parallel major. That's true, or approximately true, also of Mahler's earlier symphonies as well, but not of the sixth. In the first movement of Beethoven's last symphony, the exposition is not repeated. That makes it unique among Beethoven's symphonies. In the Mahler sixth, the first movement exposition is repeated which makes it unique among Mahler's symphonies. As in the case of Beethoven's C minor fifth, the first movement of his ninth ends in the same minor key it started in. Mahler's first movement, which begins in A minor darkness, ends with an A major shout of triumph. Both second movements, Beethoven's and Mahler's, are dark minor key scherzos with less dark major key trios, but Beethoven's is self-assured minor key music, unfolding in an excited but completely orderly way, while Mahler's wallows in bitterness and occasionally threatens to fly apart at the seams. The trios also couldn't be more different. Beethoven rushes joyfully into its own future while that of Mahler stumbles and falters and trips over its own shoelaces. The ending of Beethoven's scherzo for all its forcefulness is overwhelmingly positive. 
Conversely, it would be difficult to imagine darker music than the music that finishes the scherzo of Mahler's sixth. The third movements are alike but different. Both are set in major keys, but that of Beethoven is familiar sounding, the submediate key of the symphony as a whole, while Mahler's choice is outlandish, E flat major in an A minor context, literally as far away from home as it is possible to get, like being on the opposite side of the planet. Beethoven's slow movement is a set of alternating variations on two contrasting themes, the first serene, the second ardent. Mahler has chosen the ABA pattern, although somewhat informed both by sonata principles and the variation ideal. Both are islands of serenity, but Mahler's is far more otherworldly than Beethoven's and rises to a pitch of passion that was far beyond anything Beethoven ever found notes to express. Then there are the finales. It is at that point, of course, that Beethoven found himself at the limit of what he could express by purely instrumental means. He thus reviewed the first three movements at the beginning of the fourth and then included the specific articulative power of the human voice to realize his artistic vision. Mahler had taken an oddly complementary path through his compositional development, using the human voice liberally in three of his first four symphonies and invoking song in the one that doesn't specifically add the voice, but he had walked away from that necessity with the fifth and continued that path with the sixth. He found that he could say everything that he needed to say with 90 musicians on stage playing instruments. What remains then is for us to determine what the artist was trying to say. That's Goethe's first question, the question with which any artistic inquiry must begin. The conclusion I've come to is this. What Mahler set out to do in his sixth symphony was to tell the truth about ourselves to anyone who's willing to listen. The Mahler Sixth is as truthful as the book of Ecclesiastes and has just as few readers who understand the import. The finale of Mahler's Sixth Symphony is autobiographical, but Mahler is also every man, and his story is that of humankind. If the Sixth Symphony is a requiem, it is a requiem for the human species. I really can no longer hear it any other way. I need to fill you in on a few particulars and then say a couple of words about the revisions and we'll then direct you to the music. You should be aware of the symphony's motto, an A major chord dissolving into a chord of A minor over a hammering pounding in the timpani, a drill sergeant's call, left, 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 right, left. It is chilling. You will hear it in all four movements. That's the cyclicity to which I earlier alluded. You should be aware of the beginning of the first theme of the first movement, the plunging octave that sets the whole thing in motion. That plunging octave is especially significant in the final movement where it is countered by its inversion. Keep your ear on that and see how it all turns out. You should be aware of the fact that the first movement includes a theme that Mahler apparently intended as a musical portrait of his wife Alma. He told her that. I wonder what she thought of it, especially the theme's short B section. You should be aware of some alpine imagery the use of some cowbells to invoke the serenity of high alpine meadows, a sound which, as Mahler said, might be imagined to be the last earthly thing a departing spirit hears as it lofts over the mountains on its way heavenward. You should be aware of the fact that there are some hammer blows in the finale. How many hammer blows? That's a question that I'll take up now along with the problem of the order of the inner movements. I'll start by telling you what I think happened. 
This is something I've deduced from reading every Mahler biography I can get my hands on. One never finds it stated this way explicitly, but when you sift through the accounts, what appears to have happened is that the composer found his own creation unexpectedly horrifying when he actually took it into rehearsal, almost like Dr. Frankenstein realizing with horror what he had wrought. Its power overwhelmed him. He got cold feet. He had always been somewhat superstitious and was never the most secure human being, despite his having plenty of reasons at that time of his life to trust the soundness of his judgment and the generosity of fate. The sixth was too much even for Mahler, so he vandalized it. He weakened it horribly. All of his revisions prior to these aimed at improving the work, strengthening it. Not so those that he made to the sixth. He reversed the order of the inner movements, utterly obliterating the logical, classical flow that he obviously intended as a vehicle for his avant-garde musical ideas. If the scherzo follows the first movement directly, as it does in this recording, it's, it's a continuation. The scherzo obviously comments on its predecessor, taking up the same ideas and developing them further, then furnishing a dark and, as it turns out, utterly appropriate foil to the triumphant A major ending of movement one. The E flat major slow movement then really does become the island of serenity that it was meant to be, just as Beethoven had meant it. And the C minor opening of the finale then makes perfect sense coming out of E flat major. It's a way back into the world that had been left behind, a classical way back, an acoustically logical way back in. So in case you were wondering, in my book, the original order of movements absolutely must be restored in performance. Just because the reversal represented Mahler's last published word on it doesn't mean that it's the best way to hear Mahler's sixth. Let's hear it as the artist originally intended it. The original is incredibly powerful. The revision is just incoherent. The other problem is, of course, that of the third hammer blow, which originally provided a shattering opening for the consequent paragraph of the first section of the coda. The third blow that topples the protagonist. That always seems so real to me. It was the third heart attack that ushered my paternal grandfather into the kingdom of Jesus when I was 11 years old and forming lasting memories. Three strikes and you're out. The removal of that third hammer blow was an act of vandalism. It must be restored. I wish Giuseppe Sinopoli had restored it for the reading that you are about to hear. At least I'm glad that he presented the movements in the right order. The Philharmonia Orchestra also sounds mostly pretty good in this recording, although some of them were plainly tuckered out by the time they got to the end of the finale, but realistically, who wouldn't be? I'm worn to a frazzle, and I haven't played a note of it. I'll let Alban Baird have the last word. He declared the Mahler sixth the only sixth, the pastoral notwithstanding. I almost agree with him. I think he overlooked the Tchaikovsky sixth, but then I doubt he found Tchaikovsky's music all that congenial. Next week, I'll start to work on the rest of Mahler, beginning with the Enigmatic Seventh. I have much to learn, and I'm looking forward to it.